Hello and welcome everyone. Today we're going to discuss how and why Baseball Hall of Fame legends Jackie Robinson and Willie Mays were passed up by the Boston Red Sox. Boston had their chance, but they struck out. Let's learn more about that on this episode of History and Relics. Jackie Robinson was playing for the Kansas City Monarchs of the Negro Leagues in 1945, and the day before the start of the regular season on April 16th, he and two other black ball players, Sammy Jethro of the Cleveland Buckeyes and Marvin Williams of the Philadelphia Stars, were given a tryout at Boston's Fenway Park. The Boston Red Sox owner at the time was Tom Yockey, who had purchased the team on February 25, 1933 for one and a quarter million dollars. Yaki persuaded friend and former Philadelphia Athletic second baseman Eddie Collins to be the team's vice president and general manager. Yaki was the sole owner of the team for 44 seasons. Eddie Collins retired at the end of the 1947 season, serving 15 seasons alongside Yaki. The three ball players were skeptical, and they had every right to be. At the tryout, there weren't even any reporters. It wasn't learned until years later when Isidore Muchnick, the city councilor at the time, disclosed that the tryout was a secret event at the insistence of the Red Sox, who coincidentally was getting heat from the city and Muchnick at the same time for not signing any black ball players, to which the city threatened to revoke the Red Sox use of Fenway Park for Sunday games if they didn't at least consider the idea. Much Nick later recalled that he hadn't seen anyone hit the wall like Robinson did that day. He also remembered manager Joe Cronin commenting that if Robinson was on the team, the Sox would be a world beater. Sadly, the only other people in the stands were team officials, who, by some accounts, only yelled expletives at the ballplayers. Jackie later commented that owner Tom Yonke was one of the most bigoted guys in baseball. Robinson also recalled his tryout saying, yeah, I still remember how I hit the ball that day. Good to all fields. What happened? Nothing. Then came Clyde Sukaforth, a former major league player himself, turned coach and scout for the Brooklyn Dodgers. The Dodgers president, Branch Rickey, was making secret plans in 1946 to break organized baseball's six decades long gentlemen's agreement that enforced racial segregation. And how was he going to do that? Well, from a recommendation that came his way from sports journalist Wendell Smith. That recommendation? Jackie Robinson. Branch Rickey would later send Sukaforth to Chicago to seek out Jackie Robinson, who was still playing for the Monarchs, and to urge him to come back to Brooklyn with him. Finally, Sukaforth and Robinson met up in Toledo, Ohio, and made their way back to Brooklyn by train. Ricky signed Robinson to a contract to play with Brooklyn's International League farm team, the Montreal Royals, in 1946. In 1947, Sukaforth made interim manager of the Dodgers after Leo DeRocher was suspended for the season for being associated with known gamblers. However, before the start of his suspension, he played a worthy role in helping to erase baseball's color line. He let it be known that he wouldn't tolerate anyone's opposition to Jackie Robinson's joining the club. He even said, I don't care if the guy's yellow or black, or if he has stripes like a zebra. I'm the manager of this team, and I say he plays. What's more, I say he can make us all rich, and if any one of you cannot use the money, I will see to it that you're all traded. 
So you can forthrow Robinson's name into the Dodger lineup on opening day, April 15, 1947. The Dodgers played against the Braves at Ebbets Field. And the rest, they say, is history. Robinson went on to have a Hall of Fame career, becoming Major League Baseball's Rookie of the Year in 1947. He appeared in six All-Star games from 1949 to 1954, was a National League MVP in 1949, and a World Series champ in 1955. He entered the Baseball Hall of Fame in 1962 alongside Cleveland's pitcher, Bob Feller. Now we don't have a particular piece of memorabilia of Jackie Robinson's, but what we do have is a game used bat from 1928 to 1930 of Buddy Ryan. He played for the Cleveland Naps in 1912 and 1913, but his baseball career as a player or manager lasted through 1948. The bat presented here does not reference a model number on it, but through the authentication process at PSA DNA Authentication Services, they attributed this bat directly to Buddy Ryan through Louisville Slugger Records, showing it as an R17. The model R17 was first made for and used by Ryan. But during the late 1940s and early 1950s, the R17 was also the main bat model used by Jackie Robinson. In 1948, Willie Mays was playing for the Negro Leagues as well for a team called the Birmingham Black Barons out of Birmingham, Alabama. This team had a lease agreement with a Red Sox affiliate, which went by a very similar name of just the Birmingham Barons. As part of the lease agreement, the Red Sox had exclusive rights to sign Willie Mays. By 1949, Red Sox manager Joe Cronin received a tip-off about Mays, who had been catching the eye of several other teams as well, including the New York Yankees and Boston Braves. So Cronin sent a scout from Texas named Larry Woodall to Birmingham to check Mays out. Now a few words about Larry Woodall. Woodall was a former major leaguer himself who played with the Detroit Tigers from 1920 to 1929 and was a teammate alongside player manager Ty Cobb from 1920 to 1926. We're going to pause for a minute as we have a featured relic to show you. Larry Woodall's 1922-1925 game used professional model Louisville Slugger bat. If only this bat could talk and tell you the stories about Ty Cobb. The bat features Woodall's name in block lettering, meaning that he did not have an endorsement with Louisville Slugger. If he had, his name would appear as his signature in script. This bat was authenticated by John Tobby of PSA DNA Authentication Services. It has a unique feature, side writing. Back in the day when a player was in need of bats of the same model, it was commonplace for the player to send his preferred model back to the slugger factory to request more of the same type. Upon receipt, an area of the barrel was planed and inscribed with the player's name, date received, etc. In this particular case, Woodall's teammate, John Bassler, sent this back to the factory on April 15, 1926. John Bassler was a catcher for Detroit from 1921 to 1927. He previously played for the Cleveland Naps back in the teens and would later become good friends and a coach to Cleveland Indians' Bob Feller. Okay, now back to Woodall in his assignment to scout Willie Mays. Upon arrival in Birmingham, Alabama, the weather was less than stellar for a tryout. It rained for the first three days Woodall was there, and he gave up and refused to stay any longer to give Mays a chance, along with saying a few other racial expletives as to why he wasn't staying. So, he returned to Texas. That gave way to another Red Sox scout named George Digby who went to Birmingham to see Mays, and he wrote a glowing report. In fact, he worked with Black Barons owner Tom Hayes and negotiated a deal to buy out Mays' contract from the team for $4,500. When the call was made to the Red Sox front office to tell of the news on Mays, the same shameful mistake happened once again, as it did earlier for Jackie Robinson. Tom Yockey had his mind already made up that the Red Sox weren't going to take 
any black players. Another great opportunity passed once more. Can you even imagine the Red Sox lineup that we're talking about here? Jackie Robinson, Ted Williams, Bobby Doerr, Dom DiMaggio, and Willie Mays? Holy cow. Yeah, I think the Red Sox struck out here big time. Willie Mays later recalled, There's no telling what I would have been able to do in Boston. To be honest, I really thought I was going to Boston. They had a guy come down and look at me. They had a good team with Parnell, Stevens, and of course Ted. But for that Yawkey, everyone knew he was a racist. He didn't want me. Well, the story doesn't end too bad, though, thanks to Edward Montagu, who was a former Major League player with the Cleveland Indians in the late 20s and early 30s, turned scout, and eventually signed Willie Mays with the New York Giants. And just as in the case with Jackie Robinson, the rest was history. Mays went on to be Rookie of the Year in 1951, World Series champ in 1954, and was a 24-time All-Star between 1954 and 1973, a two-time National League MVP, 1954 and 1965, a 12-time Gold Glove Award winner, 1957 to 1968, made team captain in 1964, making Mays the first black captain of a major league team, he hit four home runs in one game on April 30th, 1961. And speaking of home runs, he ended his career with 660. Willie Mays was inducted into the Baseball Hall of Fame in 1979. Now as we come into the home stretch of today's program, what better way to top things off than to show you a relic that Willie Mays once held in his hands in 1964. A professional model, Louisville Slugger. Check this out. This is one of Willie Mays' game-used bats, a Model S2 from 1964. As in the case of Larry Woodall's, Mays' name appears in block lettering, as he did not have an endorsement with Louisville Slugger. And what's really awesome about this bat is that it's autographed by Willie Mays. He even added his Say Hey inscription. Say Hey refers to his nickname the Say Hey Kid, given to him by New York's Journal American sports writer, Barney Kremenko. Kremenko once said that Mays would blurt out, say who, say what, say where, say hey. So in his write-ups in the paper, Kremenko tabbed Mays, the Say Hey Kid, and it just stuck. Now this bat has been triple authenticated by Willie Mays himself through his Say Hey authentication, Major League Baseball, and by John Tobby of PSA DNA Authentication Services. You really cannot get any better validation than that. The Boston Red Sox were the last Major League team to integrate a black player onto their team. It took until 1959 when Elijah Pumsey Green made the team some 12 years after Jackie Robinson's rookie season with the Brooklyn Dodgers and some two and a half years after his retirement. In 2018, the Red Sox publicly distanced themselves from former owner Tom Yawkey due to allegations of racism and resistance to baseball's integration. It's been a slow go throughout history, but the corner has been turned. A new chapter is in the midst of being written, and even brighter days still lie ahead. Thank you for joining us today. We hope you enjoyed our program. If you like our content, please like, share, and subscribe to our channel. It costs nothing, but means a lot to us and keeps us growing. So until next time, everyone, this one's history.